started my first business several years ago, our relationship with the Chamber of Commerce was part of our secret sauce that made us successful. And their support provided visibility and business changes that we could not see coming. As you can imagine, the word pivot can mean different things to different people. From a business perspective, it's important to be able to pivot, to be able to navigate the rapid changes that occur in the business landscape every day. It's not exactly the same thing as having a plan B. It's more like taking your plan A and turning it upside down. Our featured presenter today knows quite a bit about pivoting. Mark Kwame is the co-founder and partner of Drive Capital. Mark's fearless approach to business is inspiring. His insights on how to take calculated risks are admirable, and his enthusiasm is infectious. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Mark Kwame from Drive Capital. How are you doing, sir? Thanks, Mark. Good to see you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Wow. Thank you very much. I'm, uh, I'm really honored to be here today. Uh, I'm just celebrating my fifth year in Columbus, Ohio. Uh, very, very, a couple years ago, I became the born-again Buckeye. Uh, I spent my first 50 years in California, and many of you know this, but I, I, I was very fortunate to grow up in a great place, uh, among the cherry orchards and apricot orchards of, uh, of the Silicon Valley that is now known as the Silicon Valley. Actually, it's kind of funny. Apple Computer is actually built on an apricot orchard. I don't know what that means exactly, but uh, I used to drive by those fields where they used to dry the apricots. And so, what I, you know, five years ago, I came here to Columbus. And quite frankly, I knew nothing about Columbus. I'd been here, I think, once or twice before. And when Governor Kasich asked me to come out and uh, run economic development uh, at the Department of Development, I, I truly was coming here for a, a short six-month stint just to help out a friend. And what I found here was something really, really special. It didn't take too long. Um, within the first couple of weeks, I found, you know, wonderful entrepreneurs, a great you know, caring business community. I met folks like Alex Fisher of the Columbus Partnership. I met the folks from the Chamber of Commerce here, from the folks up in Cleveland, to Cincinnati, to Toledo, to Youngstown, to everywhere around the state. And I saw a group of people and a group of businesses that truly cared about the place they lived in and the things that they did. But I also saw a group of people that were a bit beaten down, quite frankly. This is right after we had lost 350,000 jobs, we had the recession of 2008 that really impacted everywhere. And so we, we saw people that you know, wanted to be lifted up a little bit. But what was really encouraging to me, whether you know, whoever it was in the community, people knew they could do it here. And uh, you know, the other thing I found was a great group of people that you know, young entrepreneurs trying new things and, and risking and what was interesting, I had this, this common refrain that I heard from the entrepreneurs. They said, you know, we really want to go build it here, but, you know, people don't understand us. They don't understand the risks that we're taking. And in fact, you know, the thing that, uh, the one thing I'd say about Silicon Valley that is different about the, a bit about the Midwest culture is how you look at risk. I've been very fortunate to be successful in my life. But I have had many, 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 many failures, okay? The first company I founded right out of Apple Computer, I, I was at Apple Computer for four and a half years, and I was, you know, a bright-eyed, uh, bushy-tailed 25-year-old, uh, and I started my first company. It grew. We had about 15, 20 people, and then two of my customers went bankrupt, and we had to soft land the business. That was International Solutions. Well, in the Silicon Valley, that's a badge of honor. You went out and tried something. It's a risk. And some of the things I was seeing here in the Midwest was that, that, that risk, that going for it, was a bit of a scarlet letter. It wasn't a badge of honor. Because if you don't try things, you never learn. It's kind of like I have two, I have my, my young daughter, Gracie Jean here, my wife Meg is here. And you know, Gracie Jean learned how to walk by falling. I used to teach skiers um, when I was younger. I was a ski patrolman. And people would say, yeah, I went down the hill and I didn't fall. I'd say, well, you didn't try hard enough. Talk about how many times you fell over, not how many times you didn't. So what I want to talk to you here about today a bit is how venture capital works, but how it works around risk and entrepreneurship. Venture capital is an interesting word. In French, it's capital à autrisque. 
okay, which means capital of high risk. Okay, when we invest in a company, I'm sitting there pounding the table with my partners. I know 50 to 60 to 70% of the time that company we're investing in may not work and may fail. Because you have to go out and try big things to go to have big, big rewards. You know, when Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak started Apple in their garage, they had no idea this was going to happen. They just built a computer because they wanted their own computer. Turns out we all wanted computers, okay? Same thing with whether it's Google or Yahoo or Facebook. I mean, my favorite Facebook story, I mean, Mark Zuckerberg started Facebook so he can get his girlfriend back. I mean, that, what a lofty goal. Um, you know, these things are started for the purest intentions. It just turns out that everybody wants to use those things. So in order to have venture capital, and every one of you out there, many of you out there are venture capitalists. If you're an entrepreneur, you take your savings, your credit cards, and you go for it. One of my favorite stories is the founder of, um, of uh, Federal Express, Fred Smith, you know, he couldn't make, how many people are worrying about payroll next week? You worry about it, okay? It's really, really hard to start a business. Fred Smith couldn't make payroll. He went to Vegas and put it on red because he had to get, he, had, he only had half the payroll. And he bet everything. I don't suggest that to you entrepreneurs. Um, maybe the Columbus Casino would like you to do that. But uh, I would not suggest you going down and putting it all on red. But you need to take, you need to have a culture of risk. Risk is a good thing. And so, as I look at what's going on in Columbus, as the mayor so eloquently put and the chamber folks have put here, is this is a fabulous place to build a business. And I'm going to talk about this a little bit later, but the Columbus has all the key ingredients. And quite frankly, I would have not bet my career, my first 50 years were in California, I, I hope my next 50 years here are here in Columbus, because I truly do believe this is the next land of opportunity. But we need more risk takers. We need the Tanisha Robinsons. We need the folks that cover my meds. We need the Sean Lanes. We need the Alex Fromeyers who you're going to meet here real soon. We need folks that are willing to go for it. But just as importantly, we need folks in the community, whether they're the bankers or the angels or all these other, we need folks in the community to support risk and say it's okay if you fail. So I thought I'd burn this in with, a, uh, with an analogy. I like to race cars. This is my race truck, um, and my wife is very gracious to let me race. Uh, and so th this is my passion. I love doing this, okay? And when you do something like this, it's like starting a business. I decided to do this three or four years ago. And many of you may have known I used to ride motocross and, and ride motorcycles, and there's this great expression, with age comes a cage. Uh, and so I finally smarted, uh, got smart at 52 and started racing off-road dirt trucks versus racing motocross motorcycles. But this is an example. When you have a passion, you want to go do it. You want to go try it. You want to go figure it out. Okay? So when I went to go start racing uh, cars, I went and practiced. Okay? So the first thing you do is you go out and practice. But you have, you, what you have is you have nerves. And every time... I get into that car, I have great nerves. And actually, I raced the Daytona 24 three weeks ago, four weeks ago, the 24 hours of Daytona, and uh, in a prototype challenge car. And it was an amazing experience. But right before, I sent uh, Jason Day, who's an, you know, the number one golfer of the year at the end of the year last year, a friend of mine and a Westerville resident, I sent him a text and said, Jason, I'm kind of scared. Every time I lace up my shoes, I get scared. He texted me this. And I think this is a great, one of the great quotes about risk. Nerves are a good thing. You should be nervous. If you're doing a business, it's hard work and you've got everything on the line. They will heighten your senses and focus. What better way to heighten your sense and focus if you can't make payroll next week? You kind of get focused, okay? Just focus on what makes you good and that's it. So focus on what's really, really good and what you're really, really good at and let the, use those nerves to your advantage. I told Jason when he's done golfing, he's got to go on the, uh, on the inspirational speaking circuit. I mean, he literally just typed this to me in a, in a text, which I thought was just beautiful. So anyway, when you want to go out and start a, a, start a business, you first go try things, okay? 
So this is, uh, this is a test I did in, in, uh, in Prim in my off-road dirt truck. So what I did was I, had an, I, ha I found someone who really knew a lot about the business, a guy named Steve Barlow. Uh, I got into the, uh, the truck and went testing to learn how these sorts of things work. And I'd say you should do the same thing as an entrepreneur. You should talk to everyone in your, in your community. You should talk to the bankers. You should talk to the lawyers. You should talk to all these fun folks and go out and try to go do it. But then eventually you got to go. So let's turn it up here. of life and you keep going forward and you hit some big jumps some things kind of work this is about a 150 foot jump this next one um, and you go out and try things okay but but you got to push the limits because if you don't push the limits and take the risk you will not have the work so this jump coming up is 200 feet so let's just watch that turn it up here for a sec this one right here about 900 horsepower that's just exhilarating uh, so anyway so you go out and start you practice you get it going you hire a couple people okay but you need whenever you take risks in businesses things can happen things can go wrong okay and so unfortunately things go wrong in racing as well and so this is what happens when yeah things don't go the way you think you can turn it up I did win wreck of the year. So, but, you know, just like in business, in racing, you have Hans devices that protect your neck, you have five point harnesses, you have steel alloy all around you, and you have a very understanding wife. Um, she was actually at home watching this race. This was on NBC uh, with our, how old was Magnus then? A month old. Uh, so it was a little bit disconcerting, but everything worked out okay, so I'm here. But just like businesses, you, you know, if you're going to take risks, things do happen. You've got to prepare yourself for those risks. That's why you need to have the capital, you need to have the advice, you need to have the people around you. Because once you do that, what you're able to do is, click, there we go. That's what it looked like afterwards, by the way. Uh, they had to cut me out of it, but anyway. Uh, then you go out and build out, you build a, your, next, your next business. If, you're, if the business fails, that's okay. In fact, that ca that, in that case, that truck was garbage. So we had to go build a brand new truck, and you go off and do it again. So that's the key thing here. And I really do believe, and we'll talk about all the strengths of Columbus, but the one thing we need to understand is a culture of risk. And it is okay if you risk and fail. Okay, think about it. Silicon Valley, you know, most of the great entrepreneurs you've heard about have failed miserably. Okay? I mean, Steve Jobs, the vaulted Steve Jobs, does Apple Computer, starts out, does what gets kicked out in 1984, goes to Next Computer. A dismal failure. Goes back to Apple, did okay. Okay? He had a terrible, you know, terrible failure. Reed Hoffman, the founder of uh, LinkedIn, a good friend of mine, his first company, Failure. I mean, every single one of these folks have, uh, have seen failure. Elon Musk, you know, the vault, I mean, the guy who everyone thinks, you know, does everything perfectly. I mean, he was that close to basically everything going away. Okay? Um, and so you have to have this risk of failure. Uh, a, a risk and an association with failure. Very, very important because failure is a good thing. Because if you don't fail, you don't learn. And I really challenge all of you out there, because here in Columbus, 
we have one of the best places on the planet to build a company. We have amazing educational institutions from, of course, Ohio State. But I wouldn't forget Columbus State. I wouldn't forget Columbus College of Art and Design. I wouldn't forget, you know, Capital University. There's, we have an amazing educational element here. And we have tens of thousands of young people coming here. Here's a little thing. So Sequoia, my former firm, Sequoia Capital, the companies where they were the first investor in represent uh, t over 20% of the NASDAQ. The average age of the person we funded at Sequoia was 23 and a half. Average. I mean, many people here, when I tell people here that we handed an 18-year-old a $7 million check, they think we're crazy. Guess what, folks? The reason why 20-somethings are the best entrepreneurs is they have no, uh, they don't have a mortgage, they don't have a significant other, they don't have kids, they can just go solely focus into one thing and go make it happen. They can have that passion and that risk tolerance that is very, very high. It's the same thing at, at, at Drive Capital. Many of our, uh, our founders are in their 20s, early, mid 20s. So what you have here in Columbus is you have access to all these kids coming in here from OSU, from obviously our families and things like that. Second thing, we have phenomenal businesses here. And people kind of give me um, a little bit of grief for saying this, but we have great businesses to find employees to go to startups who are experienced people. But, you know, Columbus is a great place to start a business because you have Nationwide, because you have Cardinal, because you have a Huntington Bank, because you have Ohio Health, because you have all these great companies here who are, have great folks that can help build the community and build new businesses. Because with thriving new businesses, you have a thriving uh, economy. The next thing you have is you have location, location, location. The thing I did not appreciate until coming to Columbus is how far away California is. I mean, it's a long ways away from most of the United States. A one-day car drive from Columbus, you hit 60%, 60% of the GDP of the United States. Okay, 60% of the manufacturing base, 60% of the population is all right here near Columbus. The other thing that you have is you have a business community that wants to see you succeed. You have folks like Les Wexner, Steve Steinauer, um, David Blum. You have folks here that want to see these entrepreneurial companies grow and do things. And they are there for help. I mean, I cannot tell you how many times myself or one of my entrepreneurs have picked up a phone and they will sit down and help. We were attracting a young entrepreneur here to, uh, to Columbus. I mean, Les, who's this you know, incredible you know, business icon, spent 45 minutes with this young lady trying to convince her uh, to move her three-person company to Columbus, Ohio. That doesn't happen in Silicon Valley. That just uh, Tim Cook at Apple does not do that. John Chambers it's, it doesn't do that. Okay, we have that capability here, so we have this business community to do that. But the key thing also is we need to continue to work together. And I would challenge the chamber. There's about forty-five thousand businesses here in in, Col in Columbus. There's about a thousand twelve hundred chamber members. We need to reunite even more. We need to have. 3,000, 4,000, 5,000. I want next time this to fill the whole room, okay, the whole um, conference center. We need to come together as a group and tell the story. Facebook just recently did a study, and they analyzed the network of everyone on Facebook, because most, about, over, well over, I forget what it is, a billion and a half people use Facebook. Turns out the average person is only uh, separated by three and a half degrees to every human being on the planet. Six degrees is actually was too many degrees. Three and a half degrees. So think about the thousand people in this room. Okay, you are on average three and a half degrees separated to almost everyone on the planet. Tell the story of Columbus. Be proud of the story of Columbus. This is a great place to come. Everyone comes, by the way, stop complaining about the weather. I mean, the weather is fantastic. You got to change the seasons. You got, I mean, wasn't fall spectacular this year? We don't have fall in California. They miss all those colors. 
okay? They don't have a white Christmas. Imagine not sledding on Christmas. I guess this Christmas we didn't do much sledding, but anyway. Um, this is a great place. I was in an ele- My wife and I were down in, in Florida uh, a couple years ago. I think I was doing a race, and I was in an elevator, and uh, a woman saw my, I was look, I, on my, on my, my uh, iPhone, I have uh, my, uh, my, my license is right there next, next to my iPhone. And she goes, oh, you're from Ohio, pretty dumb place. You're probably going to come down to Florida. I mean, she was like dissing Ohio. I said, why are you dissing Ohio? She's, she was from Ohio. I go, what are you doing? This is a marketing event. Give me your elevator pitch on Ohio. Okay? Do not apologize for anything. This is a phenomenal place. But let me tell you what I worry about. Uh, when I came here, people were a little bit scared. We lost 350,000 jobs. You know, businesses were shutting down. And people would try new things. That's when Columbus 2020 really did grow. And what's going on here at the Chamber and the Columbus Partnership. And, you know, we did the Jobs Ohio and all this stuff. People were willing to do new things. As the, as the mayor just uh, eloquently put, we've had a lot of success here. We have a low unemployment rate. We have uh, a lot of great things going on. We cannot be complacent. We cannot be complacent. We've got to keep pushing and pushing and pushing. Because this, I truly do believe, this is, I've said this about 20 times in this talk, this is the best place to build a business. But we got to keep risking. We got to keep trying new things. We got to tell everybody that this is the best place to be. Because when that happens, there's a reason why Silicon Valley and Hollywood, more importantly, is in California. Californians are shameless promotionalists. It's the greatest place on earth. Well, it isn't. High taxes, I mean, a terrible business environment. People are moving out of there like crazy. This is the best place. We just need to believe it, and we need to take it forward. So I would like to challenge you here today that hopefully under Don's leadership and, and the chamber, in five years, we'll have 5,000 people in this audience, 5,000 members, and we'll all be celebrating the great risks and rewards here in Columbus, Ohio. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Um, I, I just texted my wife, by the way, honey, Valette's, my wife's here somewhere, so I'm, I am going to go play with Mark for the weekend. We're going to go play with so she's like, okay. Um, Mark, th- thank you for inspiring insights this morning, but we're not quite done. Uh, we have invited a leader from a company that you and Drive Capital helped fund to join uh, in today's conversation. With that said, we'd like to welcome to the stage and introduce Alex Frohmeyer, also known as Fro. Fro is the founder and CEO of Beam Dental, an innovative dental insurance company headquartered here in central Ohio. To learn more, I urge you to listen to our CBuzz podcast featuring Fro. He has his own dynamic story. Please join me in welcoming Fro to the stage. I got to admit, this guy's very, very uh, courageous. We're the ones that funded his company, so I'm curious to see what these (laughs) questions are. This is, a, this is a risky endeavor here. Uh, so first, I uh, thought your talk was awesome. Um, of course you did. Of course. <laughs> I'm highly incentivized to say that. Yeah, awesome. exactly. Uh, I don't know if you created more entrepreneurs or more racing enthusiasts, so <laughs> it, the footage is great. Um, so I think one of the things, so we, we've got a few minutes to chat, um, so I want to kind of piggyback off of a lot of the themes you talked about. Um, one thing that I thought was awesome and so Drive Capital's all over the Midwest, got companies, Pittsburgh, Chicago, here, Cincinnati. Where's Columbus at on the, on the Midwest scale? You know, kind of to the complacency theme. And then how do we look nationally? How does Columbus not only compete head to head with Boston and Denver, but also what does it look like in the Midwest today? Well, I, I actually think it's, it's very well situated. You've seen a lot of the uh, uh, surveys come out. Um, and, you know, a great place, top, uh, you know, communities to live in, cost of living index, all those kinds of things. I mean, it's a great place. But the reason why I wanted to talk about risk today, we're finding it's not the best entrepreneurial culture uh, because of a lot of the things I talked about. 
And quite frankly, the entrepreneurial culture is stronger in Chicago. It's stronger in Pittsburgh. It's stronger in Indianapolis. It's a great place to build a company, like we moved you from Louisville here to Columbus, yep. because this is a great place to build a company. But we're not seeing the, the real entrepreneurial fervor that we're seeing in some of the other cities. Other than that, I, I truly do believe this is one of the, if not the best place to build a company. So do, does that to you come down to an attitude? Is it a culture, an attitude, before it's about talent or other factors? Yeah, it's not about talent, it's not about education, it's not about capability, it's not about anything. It's, it, there is a bit of a, um, a culture that, it, it, like I said, if you fail, it's a scarlet letter, okay? We need to celebrate failure. In fact, you know, Don, I think we should have the Best Failures of Columbus Award. Because if we don't have Another that... Another large glass. I'd be a big old... Drink. Yeah, we should get... You <laughs> failed the best. I won the best wreck of the war, uh, year. So, you know, him, I got a big trophy. I didn't win the series, but I did win best wreck. Um, mm -hmm. So that's... We should really celebrate that. Agreed. Um, so another theme, natural resources. Yep. Columbus has a huge student population, ton of talented people here. Um, capital, draft yep. capital, uh, NCT Ventures, a handful of other early stage focus funds are in, in the state and, and in Columbus. What needs to pile on top of, of, you know, so those are kind of the basics, right? You need really smart people and you need some capital to get things started yeah. and moving. What, what else needs to come in beyond just a, a, maybe an attitude adjustment or a, a culture that suggests more things can grow and really explode here? Well, I, I think what's going to happen, you look at Indianapolis, for example. They had a company called Exact Target. Exact Target was uh, created by a guy named Scott Dorsey, grown very rapidly, and it was bought by Salesforce uh, for $3 billion. The minute a company has grown and is bought, all of a sudden, 50, 60, 70 companies have now been created from Exact Target. Because they've seen the win. They see, they've seen the win, they've seen all that, okay? We, we need to see one of those here, whether that's Cover My Meds or it's one of our companies or it's, it's somebody. We need to have another very large company grow very rapidly because people forget Apple Computer was basically you know, populated with folks from National Semiconductor. You know, folks left Apple Computer and created a whole bunch of other companies. I mean, Facebook was basically, you know, Sheryl Sandberg came from Google. A lot of the Google people came from Facebook. A lot of the Google people came from Yahoo. A lot of Yahoo people came from eBay. I mean, <laughs> that's just the way it goes, right? Mm -hmm. And so what we need to do is we need to start creating that, you know, virtuous cycle where, you know, we see these companies growing every three, four, five years. I mean, that's the, the, the magic of Silicon Valley, if you think about it, is about every five years they create a company worth $100 billion. I mean, that's pretty amazing. Uh, and so, and that doesn't include all the other ones. Uh, and so what we need to do is we need to have, you know, the cardinal health then begets this. I mean, quite frankly, we've had some of that here, a lot of that out of sure. L Brands with Abercrombie & Fitch, with uh, Express, with Alliance Data, uh, and then, of course, uh, you know, what, what cardinal health has done. But we, we need to accelerate that. Right, and, and so it's not, just, it's not just having those examples, but seeing the dynamics happen, right? You need to see something get created, and in not just one career or one lifetime, but in one decade. Yeah. Uh, which is exact target story. I mean, in a decade, they created a $3 billion company in Indianapolis, right? As something exactly. that had never existed there before. Well, what I'm really excited about is I'm, I'm hoping, and I don't know which company it's going to be or how it's going to be done, but I, I think in the next five years, we'll be sitting here and a company of three, four, five thousand 5,000 people will be created here in, in, in Columbus, whether that company exists today or uh, will exist, you know, in the, in the future. But that's one thing you see. I mean, when I, when I funded LinkedIn in, you know, in 2003, it was eight people, okay? Now they, I don't know, 10,000 people. I don't know what they've hired. I mean, it's, it's, it's a huge company right. in not that long, you know, 13 years later. Right. And so that's what we need. We need to see that happening, and then people will then take the more risks. They'll see the, you know, the, 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 uh, the, the big goal at the end. Another interesting theme you hit on was the average age of a founder in a Sequoia investment. Yeah. What Drive's doing today, uh, lots of young founders. We were all together for uh, our portfolio CEO summit a week or so ago, and, and, and the crowds, I mean, average age is probably 30. Right. Um, what, what is the power of the 20-something the beyond just, you know, I don't have a mortgage, so I can, I can afford to take risk, but what else about, what else should we be encouraging about letting young people really drive the discussion in, in technology and, uh, and entrepreneurship? Well, I, the key thing I think is, is that young people and 20-somethings don't need adult supervision. 
They just don't need it. They don't need their Eric Schmidt? The, the, no, what they, what they need is they need people to help them see around the corner. But at the end of the day, you know, as you know, whether it's Ned and Chris or myself, we try to help you see around the corner. But at the end of the day, it's your company. You're right. running it. And you've got to you gotta make mistakes just like we've got to make mistakes. And so what we need is business advisors, you know, that don't tell the entrepreneur what to do. Because what they did, you know, what I did five years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years, doesn't work. It, what works today is what works today. And I think the 20-something knows what works today because they're living it and breathing it. I, I hate to say it that once kind of we're over, I'm 50, I'll be 55 this month. Once you get 35-ish or older, it's really hard to reinvent yourself. You're gone. You're gone. You're useless. useless. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to be there soon, Alan. <laughs> That's true. Um, well, I, you know, I do think it is remarkable when we're talking about building big companies. You know, we, my, you know, my co-founders and I were all 27 or 28. Um, we kind of take a step back pretty often and say, this is incredible. You know, we've got great advisors who, who have been around the block, who do know things, who, who have seen great things be built and know how to bring that experience to the table. But we're constantly amazed by, you know, having a staff of 24, 25 people, um, and we're we're the people responsible for that and building that every day and, uh, and having no prior experience doing it. Yeah. Um, and so for us, it's a really, it's surreal, but we also recognize at some level the importance of what we think the 21st century economy is about, which is a lot of people who look like us doing, taking these types of risks and um, building companies that either last um, a little bit of time or potentially into perpetuity. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the key thing is all, all great companies are started with little insights, as I had mentioned before. I mean, your insight was you thought, I mean, dental insurance is a very antiquated business, hasn't really changed for 20, 30 years, and you come up with the idea of the connected toothbrush that can better predict, you know, how someone does right. their uh, teeth care, then you can price dental insurance better. Uh, there's a lot of, I mean, who would have thunk that, see, that started six years ago, there'd be a taxi hailing app worth $50 billion dollars doing a couple billion dollars a month in revenue called Uber. Right. Okay. Trevor, you know, he basically started the company because he wanted to show off to his friends that he could get a, a limousine. Right. I mean, that's all it was about. It really was a very, I mean, the, you were kind of talking about that earlier, that, you know, the innocent beginnings of many of these big things. Uber started as a, um, as a joke. I mean, it was, it was, it, exactly. it, was a, it was a way to look rich when you weren't. Exactly. <laughs> was, I mean, it was like, I it's, not, it's not what you own, it's what people think you own. Right. Sure. Yeah, but I mean, it's amazing. Think about that, that one for a while, folks. It's not what you want. Because actually, I started a company on that. Uh, this was 1980, when was this? 1987, I started a company called FO, F-A-U-X, nice. Systems, FO Systems. We created the cellular phony. It was a fake <laughs> cellular telephone. All the status, stat all the status without the static. Um, <laughs> we had That's some a, great How lines. did that not take off, man? No, we sold 100,000 of them. We That's were on NBC <laughs> Nightly News. That's awesome. You know the place where we sold the most cellular phonies? Silicon Valley. Los Angeles. LA. Nice. It's yeah, all yeah, okay. it's about what you th you know, it's all about perception, not reality. That's pretty that's why the three series is so popular. Exactly, LA, exactly. <laughs> um, all right, so just to kind of wrap up, let's let's talk about um, Drive Capital. What's next for Drive? And, um, and when you're looking at your the next big investment, where is it gonna come from? How's it gonna happen? Well, I mean, I think the key thing, we do need more capital here. And uh, we're very fortunate to have done what we've been able to do. But quite frankly, people always ask me, you know, do you want more competitors? Do you need more? We need more venture capital here. So we work a ton with Rich, Lang Rich Langdale at NCT. We work with the guys venture down at Ohio. At venture Ohio right. and what we're doing with Venture Ohio. I'm, I'm, I'm the chair of Venture Ohio right now. I would love to have three, four, five more funds, $100 million, $200 million funds, because people forget in Silicon Valley on 3000 Sand Hill Road, where I worked at in Sequoia, I could throw a rock and find about $20 billion. Okay? I mean, literally, maybe it would be a nine iron. But, uh, <laughs> You know, and, and importantly, those uh, twenty billion dollars syndicate routinely. They're always right? going back because what's together. right for us, you know, uh, or what's not right for us, maybe right for the next person, right. maybe right for the next person. So we need to build that. So uh, you know, anything what we're trying to do at Venture Ohio really is how do we tell the world of what's going on in Ohio so that we can attract more v VC funds. Sure. We need more venture capital here. Fifty-one percent of the venture capital in the United States is spent in the three area codes of the peninsula in San Francisco. Uh, we, we, you know, it's, you know, the whole Midwest, by the way, the Midwest 
uh, is the fifth largest country in the world. It's bigger than Brazil. It's bigger than Russia. It's bigger than India. And it, only, it has less than 6% total. That's, you know, Pittsburgh to Kansas City to Minneapolis and back has less than 6% of all venture capital in the United States, which is ridiculous. We need to attract as many people here. Because quite frankly, you know, funds in Pittsburgh will invest in Ohio. Funds in Detroit will invest in Ohio. Funds in Indianapolis will invest in Ohio. And vice versa. Ohio will invest in, you know, like, like right. we have. So we need to get, we need to tell the story. That's why, you know, we just got to get out there and tell everyone what's going, what, all the great things that are happening here. Awesome. Well, thank you for being here. Thanks for your talk, and thanks to the Chamber for having us. Thank you very much, thank folks. Thank you. Good job, man. Thank Give you. Me pictures. Good job. Thanks a lot, bro. Thank you, Mark, sir. thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. So, uh, that was a great uh, conversation and a great, uh, insightful discussion. We've enjoyed having uh, the opportunity for Mark to share his unique experiences and his vision for Central Ohio and beyond. Thank you both, guys for joining us today and sharing what, uh, why you think Columbus is such a great place to, to do business and to root your business. To our members and guests, remember, the Columbus Chamber is here to help you every step along the way. Whether it's making meaning, meaningful connections or offering business support. Connect your team, engage with our chamber, we're here to help you succeed. Thank you all for joining us this morning. Have a great day and a very successful 2016. Haters, that, 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 that don't kill me, can only make me stronger. I need you to hurry up now, cause I can't wait much longer. I know I got to be right now, cause I can't get...